Thank you. As you said, I'm Jason Terry. I work at uh, Bluehost, and we are hiring, so you can come see me after if, uh, if you're looking. Um, all the slides will be at the, the URL shown, shown here. I'll, I'll show that again at the end. Uh, this talk is about Amazon Alexa and Pearl. Uh, I will be focusing a little more on the home automation of my own experiences of using it. Uh, so what are you going to need in order to start and uh, create your own home automation uh, system? Well, first you're going to need a developer account. Thankfully, that's free. You can go to the giant URL at the top there to sign up if you haven't already. Uh, odds are if you're using AWS, you probably already have an account. Um, there are three different types of APIs. You can see those right here. Now, oddly enough, even though I'm writing a smart home application, I did not use the smart home API. The reason I did not is uh, the Smart Home API is a lot more limited in what it can do. You can ask it to turn the lights on uh, and off and stuff like that. But if you want to do more broad uh, non-automation commands or odd automations like uh, turn off the living room, it might not have that built into the, the, the API either yet or at all. Um, and so I went with the custom one, which allows you to fully define the grammar that you're going to talk to the Alexa with. There's also the flash briefing. Think of that one kind of as like it's reading an RSS feed. It, it, it literally just tells you the news. So you can ask for your daily briefing and it'll just read through whatever it gets. Um, but I did choose the custom. Uh, type of method, and that's where I'm going to really be focusing. Uh, what else will you need? You'll either need a Raspberry Pi or desktop server or something like that. You know, this isn't work. They're not providing it. You're going to have to have your own. Um, and, and what kind of server? You can really run it on anything. I personally have run mine using Hypnotoad. Uh, I actually have it running on my Synology through a Docker. Uh, the entire thing takes about 25 megs of RAM on my Docker container in my Synology, so it's relatively lightweight. Uh, probably the biggest problem I had when setting this up was getting my home firewall working. And it wasn't because of the port, it was because of this little bugger right here. You have to use port 443 and nowhere could I find where they tell you that. Uh, I had it working for a month or two and then uh, had to reset my router and lost all of my rules. And when I set it back up, I tried a different port without realizing it. It took me like two days to figure out what I was, had broken. Uh, and it was literally just because apparently Amazon does not work unless it's 443. Uh, so that is a pretty big caveat to, to watch out for. Um, so what are you going to need to do when you're setting up? When you first log in to the custom skill, you'll be presented with a screen that looks a lot like this one. Uh, this screen here shows the skill information. Uh, it, it's got just about everything on here that you're going to see. You can basically name your app. Mine is called My Home because I, I just want to be able to say, Alexa, tell my home to do something. Um, if you have a custom app, that is the drawback. You have to say your application's name. Whereas if you use the smart home skill, you can just say, Alexa, turn off the lights. Uh, so there is a, a mild drawback. It's not too bad. It, it rolls off the tongue well to say, tell my home. Um, we have the interaction model, which I'll go through in a second. The configuration basically just asks you a couple places like where's your login URL so that uh, when you are on your cell phone setting up the Alexa app, it can direct you to a login page in order to authenticate the Alexa to your system. Um, it also asks where the endpoint is for your API itself uh, so that you can fill that in. Again, those have to be SSL, which is why we have the SSL certificate uh, section here. For home use, uh, you can use one of three types of SSLs. You can pay for a genuine SSL just like you would anywhere else. The free SSL systems work really well. That's actually what I'm using. Uh, or you can even use a self-signed. They don't care. You, you would just have to give them the, the, the signed portion so that they can uh, authenticate it as, as legitimate. So you don't have to pay for anything if you're just doing this in your own house as a hobbyist. Uh, the testing page I'll get into uh, in a second. Publishing information, 
I'm just gonna kind of skipping over that because that's for the non-hobbyist. I'm doing this more as a hobbyist. I'm not publishing this anywhere uh, other than for my own internal use. Now, I have all the code up on GitHub for you guys to see, but as far as publishing the skill in Alexa uh, or in Amazon, I'm not doing that part uh, because it's my own personal skill. I'm not uh, giving that to other people. You could set your own personal skill up using my code, but again, it's your personal skill. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not going to get into that. Again, privacy and compliance, the same thing. Again, that's for companies. Um, shortly after I started working on this talk, they introduced the new beta testing area, which mostly affects the internet uh, interaction model. And that's this here. It's JSON. Uh, literally, you can copy and paste in your... Uh, commands that you want Alexa to be able to understand. In my case, all of the commands would have to be uh, prefixed with something like tell my home or ask my home. Uh, here you can see I've, I've con configured it. I have a Sony Bravia television set and I have configured it to be able to mute uh, the TV in this particular example. You can see over here I also have uh, the ability to open Netflix, I can turn off the TV. We'll uh, actually play with that right now. I don't know if my wife has the TV on, she's 2,000 miles away, but let's try to turn it off on her. <laughs> Alexa, tell my home to turn off the TV. TV is not on. Uh, she wasn't uh, watching TV at that point. so. But, but we can still try to freak her out. Alexa, turn the lights to bright. Oh, that didn't work. Alexa, set the lights to bright. Okay. There we go. That, the, the setting the lights to bright did not uh, go through my app that went through the Philips Hue, but it is something I can at least kind of freak her out with a little bit. Um, <laughs> So the, the basic uh, construct of the interaction model here is that uh, you've got your phrases, you have slots if you want wildcard interactions. Amazon has a lot of pre-built, bless you, slots that, uh, that you can uh, use such as uh, digits, numbers, uh, countries, cities and states so that uh, it can more understand uh, lots of different wild card things. In my case, I have the location of my TV. I have one upstairs and I have one downstairs. So you can see right here, I have defined a custom slot type. Uh, I've got the upstairs one showing the, the downstairs one looks just like it, but uh, in interest of making it fit on the slide well, I, I minimized it. Um, I also have the same sort of setup for each of these other intent options. Um, so that's basically all this is, is just a big JSON file. You can put any kind of things you want because we are in the custom scenario. Um, this is your testing page. I've redacted some pieces of it because it is my actual uh, stuff. We can actually show an example of this one. Alexa, tell my home hello. Alexa dispatcher says hello. So that's the, uh, the basic app that I've written. I uh, can understand a couple different things. I have it dispatching to different Perl modules. So I've written a Bravia module that's completely separate that the dispatcher will call in order to control my Bravia. I plan to write another module in the near future. Sadly, haven't had time yet to control my Philips Hue lights. My end goal is to be able to just say, uh, Alexa, turn off the living room, uh, and that she'll turn all the different things off all at once, uh, rather than just turning off the TV, just turning off the lights. Um, I also want to be able to just say, turn off the room. That's a brand new feature that they finally gave us at the very end of April. Uh, before April, you could not tell if you had five or six Alexa devices, which one was giving you the instruction. So you just had to turn everything off. Uh, they had several people who uh, had given workarounds of uh, setting up a different Amazon account for each of your devices. 
That sort of worked, but if you have multiple devices together, they actually talk to each other. And when they're on different accounts, they can't do that. So you lose some of the benefit when you put them on different accounts. Uh, they finally fixed that so that now you can tell which Alexa uh, is actually asking you to do something. So if you just say turn off the lights, uh, vendors could update to turn off the living room lights rather than your entire house, which is generally what occurs uh, right now when you're, when you're doing your Alexa stuff. Um, anyway, here is a test. We can see a small snip of a uh, service request. I'll, on the next slide will show the whole thing, as well as my response. Uh, again, they're both JSON, uh, which is why I personally chose Mojalicious to, uh, and, and Hypnotoad to run mine. Makes it a lot easier to just get that, that request in uh, as, uh, through the system. So let's uh, take a look at uh, an actual request where I've kind of redacted some pieces. That's why you see the, the odd ID numbers in here. Um, we're in Perl, so key order doesn't matter. So there's a good chance that these key orders might not be the order that Alexa actually gives them. This was just a data dump of, uh, of one of them. You'll also see that down here I actually have uh, different quote styles. That's because when I first wrote this slide, this part didn't exist. They updated recently to show that's where you can figure out which, uh, which device makes your uh, request is through here. You actually have to turn on uh, an extra feature to get this uh, enabled. I guess that's probably for backwards compatibility on people that would be strict on like Perl. We don't care if there's an extra key, but uh, Java people might not like that so much. Um, but uh, I also have a slight typo here uh, in my escaping of the quotation mark because I wrote that part by hand. So don't take this one totally verbatim, but we've basically got the, the basic parts of a request here of me trying to turn off my television. You've got your authentication piece. You've got the actual request here. You can see that I am trying to turn off my TV. Um, you can see that uh, I have not set a location. Uh, I've made it optional in my case, uh, in which case it will just do the upstairs TV. So if I just say turn off the TV, that's the upstairs one. If I say turn off the downstairs TV, then it'll turn off the correct one. Um, then you have down here, this is the new piece that they added at the end of April, which is kind of repetitive. A lot of it also shows your authentication information again. The only new piece that's significant is the device ID here for the JSON. Um, you can run this through uh, to JSON or from JSON to, to get it to parse. In, in my case, I'm using Modulicious, so it just does it for me. Um, I get the, the ID out. So, uh, oh good, that displays right. We've got a little bit of code here of what I've been doing with my uh, Alexa. So here's the uh, base uh, code for the Modulicious app. There are two endpoints. We've got the linking skill, and that is when you sign up on your cell phone, uh, that's the URL that you would end up going to in order to type in your password on the phone so that Alexa can authenticate when you do a request. Alexa itself can either handle OAuth or just straight up password uh, values. Uh, I've chosen password simply because it was easier. I didn't need the OAuth, although I do plan to, to get into that. There already is somebody else who's written an Alexa OAuth module uh, that I skimmed, so you could Google for that if you were interested in looking at, at Alexa o OAuth. And then you have the second URL here that is where Alexa actually sends the JSON requests. Um, you can see in my uh, Modulicious, I've run that one through uh, an authentication uh, so that it authenticates before it delivers the, uh, to the dispatcher. Over here, I have my basic config on uh, how Modulicious, as well as the rest of my uh, stuff is set up. You can see here I have I'm telling Modulicious, so this is just the Hypnotoad portion. The rest of this is my custom config. 
Uh, I'm telling Mojalicious what security certificates to use. I only have two workers. It's my house. I'm not going to get very many threads. I could probably turn that to one and be fine, but I, I have multiple Alexis, so I figured two would, uh, would do uh, well enough. Um, you have here where you can configure my ultimate dispatcher. Uh, it actually should say net colon colon here. I renamed it after writing this slide. I apologize. Same with this one. Um, where you can configure a couple different things on the dispatcher, uh, most notably the, uh, the password that it takes for Alexa to connect, as well as each uh, request here has a timestamp. And so for how many, whoops, wrong one, how many seconds are you going to let the request be requeued? kind of helps prevent man in the middle or other weird attacks to have the timestamp checked so that somebody can't send something. I've set mine way high. Uh, you could set it down to like 30 seconds and be fine. In this example, it's just insanely high. Uh, and then for my dispatcher, all it's doing is taking the Alexa uh, JSON and figuring out which other module should process it. So in here, I have a list of two dispatchers or two other Perl modules that it will send the, uh, the request to. Each of the modules has a little bit of meta information on what request they can uh, take care of. And it just goes through and whichever one matches first, it, it sends the, the JSON request to that one for it to handle it. Uh, and then each individual uh, module may need some basic customization. In this case, I needed to tell it where my TVs were so that it could actually contact them. Um, there's where my default for upstairs and downstairs is if I don't have any kind of a location. Um, the TV itself requires a password in order for you to send it a web request or a SOAP call in order to do different things, so that's where that is. If you've got a Bravia TV, you could just plug right into this module and use it yourself just uh, with those pieces of config. Um, we'll get a little bit deeper into the controller here. Um, so here is the authentication portion. I've trimmed it down some just so it'll fit on the slide a little bit better, but all the meat and potatoes are in here. Uh, we can see that I've got it trapped in an eval. Uh, most of my stuff is designed to throw in the event of failure. And so I'm eval trapping everything. If I get a special throw object, so I'd throw more than just text. If I throw an object, then Alexa will transform that and just say what the throw object tells it to say. So in the event of authentication failure, it gets a special object that says, say you couldn't authenticate. And so Alexa will say, I, I don't have a password. Um, then down here is the actual uh, run method object. You can see it's, uh, pass, it's loading up Alexa uh, dispatcher here. It then runs over here is my, uh, a, a small piece of my dispatcher. Again, trapped in an eval for the same purpose. If I give it a special object, it will just read back the throw message to me. Otherwise, it'll just say something didn't work so that we have at least a small assemblance of security. If it, if it gets the special object, it knows it's safe to read. If it doesn't, it just says it didn't work. And you have to go look at the logs to see why. Um, the big thing here is the find module. That's what it uses to read the meta, meta of all of your uh, different modules to figure out which of the other, uh, in, in, in this case, Bravio or the dispatcher, has uh, uh, the transaction. Down here is where I am returning either just raw text or a special hash, which can then be translated to a message that the Alexa will just read back. So when it said uh, the TV is not on, I literally just passed this message to hash, the text TV is not on, and it transforms everything into a nice Alexa response for you so you don't have to handle that part. Um, Here's a, a little GitHub shot of my uh, uh, actual uh, Alexa dispatcher. Uh, I, I have spent a fair amount of time trying to make sure it's got pretty good pod uh, and README. So if you guys want to go through that, both the dispatcher and the, 
as well as the uh, My Home, which is the actual uh, Mojalicious portion. We've got the dispatcher, and then we've got the Bravia links right here. So if you want to look more, then uh, feel free. Otherwise, thank you very much. Is there any questions? I, I, I can't hear you. What? And just for around. Alexa, tell us a joke. Why did Karl Marx dislike Earl Grey? Because all property is theft. There we go.